Amen. You know, guys, uh, just like that video, we're not looking for a whole bunch of great evangelists to go out and just do everything like a Billy Graham. I mean, the, the next Billy Graham might be in here, but you know, God might want to use you to reach that person that's going to reach somebody else that might be the next Billy Graham. I mean, we just don't have a clue, the big picture of what's going on, but we do need to step out and invite people. And that's what it's all about, is inviting people uh, to church so they can hear the Word of God and lives can change. You know, I've shared this story before, but it's uh, it's so meaningful to me. You know, back in the 1960s, there was a um, there was a garbage man that was very, very faithful in sharing the Lord with everybody that he came in contact with. And he kept sharing with this guy on his route every single week, and he would share the Lord with him, and he'd invite him to church. And, and finally, this guy gave in, and he ended up coming, and he heard the Lord, and he ended up getting saved in the process of a garbage man being faithful where he was at. Well, that guy ended up becoming a preacher, and then that guy's son ended up becoming a preacher, and that preacher is the one that's my pastor, Kevin Smith, all because in the 1960s, a garbage man was faithful in sharing the Lord. So you have no idea. There's no uh, job that's too big, too small, nothing that's insignificant. It's just being faithful with the environment that God puts us at. So let's just all be faithful and let's bring somebody to church Easter so they can hear a life-changing message that could uh, ultimately change their family. It could change their future. It could change every way they do business. So amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Well, God, we love you, and uh, again, we lift up the service. And Lord, if there's something that I shouldn't say, I pray that you would just take it from me. And Lord, if there's something I wasn't planning on saying, God, you put it on my heart. Lord, have your way in this service, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's see how good you guys are when it comes to lemons on jokes. Uh, why did the lemon hide when the bully came? Anyone? Why did the lemon hide when the bully came? He was yellow. Yeah, we need we need Mark to stay up here with the drum, right? Yeah. Okay. What did the lemon say to the lime? Sour, are you doing? Pretty bad, I know. Hey, why did the lemon cross the road? He wanted to play squash. <laughs> why did the lemon stop halfway across the road? He ran out of juice. <laughs> I like this one. Why did the doc or, or why did the lemon go see Dr. Miller for? <laughs> His stomach was sour. <laughs> and what did the doc give the injured lemon? Lemonade. Come on, guys. You should be better about this, huh? These are good jokes, amen. If you're a guest, please come back again. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Alright? Well, we've all heard it said the phrase, right? When life gives you lemons, you Make lemonade, right? We've all heard that. Well, you know what? Um, I actually went in and I looked and found out that there's actually a few more purposes that lemons, that lemons have. And here's a few more purposes that I came across. Lemons can actually freshen your refrigerator by removing odors. They can brighten gold aluminum. They can refresh cutting boards. They can keep insects out of the kitchen. They can clean your microwave. They can deodor, deodorize garbage disposals. They can prevent potatoes from turning brown. They can keep guacamole green. They can keep soggy lettuce crisp. They can keep rice from sticking. They can lighten age spots. They can create blonde highlights. They can clean and whiten nails. They can cleanse your face. They can treat flaky. Uh, they treat for flaky dandruff. They can remove berry stains. They can soften dry, scaly elbows. They can disinfect cuts and scrapes. They can soothe poison ivy rash. They can relieve rough hands and sore feet. They can remove warts. They can bleach or bleach delicate fabrics. They can remove underarm stains. That's nice, right? They can boost laundry detergent. Uh, they can rid clothes of mildew. They can wipe clothes. They can eliminate fireplace odor. They can get rid of stains on marble. They can meet, make a room scented through putting it in the humidifier. They can neutralize cat boxes. They can deodorize your humidifier. They can clean tarnished brass, brass, and they can polish chrome. Did you know lemons had that many purposes? Isn't that crazy? There's a lot of purposes for lemon. And I actually even found that there was a list that was even a lot bigger than that. So what does all these things have to do with anything, right? You're probably thinking, who cares? You didn't come to church to learn about lemons, amen? Lemons have several purposes. And if we look at lemons only in one way, then we're missing a bigger picture. We're missing more purposes if we just look at it in one way. If we look at a lemon as like a fruit, and that we peel that fruit and we eat it, then half the times, if, we, if that's the only way that we look at it, then when we do eat it, it's going to make us pucker, isn't it? 
It's going to make us pucker and it's going to leave kind of a sour taste in our mouth if we look at it in only one way. And the, and the problem is, the problem is a lot of times when we think of lemons, uh, a lot of times we can we can even think of lemon as far as like tough times or bad times. You know, in fact, it's even adopted, uh, you know, you get a lemon for a car. Anybody ever heard that before? They've even ended up placing a law in, in place called the lemon law that actually protects the buyer from that. But we associate lemons with the bad things in life, even in the tough times in life. Have any of you heard uh, people say, you know, life's given us a bunch of lemons, right? That's how can we get the phrase, if life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Because it's been associated with tough times and bad times. And the problem is this, guys, if we only look at it lemons, if we only look at the tough times in life, in one way, if we only look at it in one way and we look at it in the wrong way, then it's really going to leave us feeling like we've been sucking on a bunch of lemons, isn't it? If we look at bad things in life, it's only one way. And if we only look at tough times, it's bad things that we go through. We only look at it in one way. Then we miss maybe a bigger purpose that maybe God's trying to show us. So how are we going to handle the lemons in our life? Or shall I say, how are we going to handle the tough times in our life? Because how many of you, raise your hand if you've went through a tough time before. Anybody? We go through tough times. I mean, guys, that's unavoidable. We're going to go through tough times. We're going to go through challenging times. We're going to go through some times that are real easy, some times that are tougher than others. But how we go through it has everything to do with how we get through the life. So how are we going to find the answers to life's questions on when we go through tough times? Well, my uh, suggestion is we're going to go to the book of Philippians because we've been going through that. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up your uh, the Word of God to Philippians 1. We started going through this a couple, two or three weeks ago. And uh, the Philippians is actually uh, kind of often considered the book of joy because the Apostle Paul talks about joy so much uh, throughout this book. And he talks about how we can have more joy in life. And honestly, guys, I think we need more joy in life. I think a lot of times, you know, especially when we go through tough times, that it looks like we've just had our backsides kicked and we don't know how to go forward. So we're going to find some answers to how we get through difficult times by looking at some of pointers that the Apostle Paul gives us in these scriptures. So if you would, uh, we're going to be in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Uh, listen as I read it. Starting with verse 12. Now I want you to know, Apostle Paul said, Brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains... Most brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The later do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it mean? The important thing is that in every way whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of that, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. So if we're going to experience any kind of joy whatsoever in tough times, then we need to change our perspective when it comes to tough times. And we need to find ourselves, the first thing we need to do is to understand that number one on your fill-in is tough times can advance the gospel. Tough times can actually advance the gospel. Let's take a closer look at verses 12 through 13 for just a second, and we can look at how we can apply this to our life. Verses 12 and 13 says this, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Did the Apostle Paul say in that scripture that what's happened to me has actually stopped the gospel from going on? Did he say it actually postponed it, it actually slowed it down? What does he say? He said it actually advanced the gospel. The things that the Apostle Paul went through actually advanced the gospel, and as a result, it became a clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in change for Christ. Listen, guys, the word advance here, that the Greek used in, in the original, the word advance here is actually a military term. And what this military term means, it means a, a movement of an army into the enemy territory, and it means that the soldier moves forward, and is what they do. They go ahead and they clear all the obstacles out, they open up all the roads, they drain all the swamps, and they they build the ditches or the bridges and they build all this so the whole army can advance unhindered and so they can move forward and that's what the apostle paul is saying when he's talking about that they went forward so it, or he went through what he did so the gospel can advance the whole or the whole reason was is so that it could advance into rome 
listen guys, the Apostle Paul made a clear path for the gospel. And he's not just talking about his current situation when he said everything. See, he said everything happened, right? Everything happened for the point of advancing the gospel. So what is he talking about? Is he talking about just that current situation? Well, to find out what he's talking about on everything happened for this reason, we actually have to go back just a little bit. So I want you to write this down in your in the column of your uh, notes. And I really want to encourage you to go in and read so you can have a better understanding. But I want you to write down Acts 21. Acts 21. Starting towards the end of Acts 21, kind of in the middle, uh, it, it starts with this right here. It's talking about what the Apostle Paul's talking about when he says, all this happened so I could advance the gospel, so the gospel could be advanced. It starts with 21, and it actually takes you all the way out through the rest of the book of Acts. So you're going to read about seven or eight chapters right there, but you'll get a full understanding of what this happens. But let me give you just a quick overview of what Paul was talking about when he said, all of this happened. This is what he was talking about. Paul had actually, it had been a while since Paul had been to Jerusalem because he'd been out on several missionary trips and it had been a while since he'd been to Jerusalem. So he made his way back to Jerusalem and one of his first stops when he got there was he went into the temple to, put, to make an offering. And while he was in the temple, uh, all this religious crowd got ticked off. The religious crowd got ticked off. You want to know how come they got ticked off? It's because he brought a Gentile with him. Well, who's a Gentile? It's a non-Jew. And the Jews didn't like Gentiles. They were very, very discriminative against them, and they didn't like them. So Paul had Gentiles with him, and the religious crowd got mad. Well, what did the religious crowd do? They drugged Paul off, and they beat him. They beat him. Could you imagine that? That would be like we're sitting here in church service, and you bring somebody to church with you, maybe from a different background, a different race, a different whatever, and then you've got this group of religious people that absolutely gets furious, and they grab you and drag you out back and just beat the tar out of you for bringing somebody they don't like. Could you imagine that? Well, this is what happened to Paul. They drug him out, and I believe that they probably would have killed him if the authorities hadn't stepped in. And the authorities actually stepped in, and they arrested Paul. They arrested Paul on what charges? They didn't have any charges, but they arrested him. And while he's sitting in jail, while he's sitting in jail, this angry mob of about 40 people, they make a vow to each other, and they say that we're not going to eat or drink anything until we kill Paul. That's pretty prejudiced, wouldn't you say? And these were the kind of people that were calling themselves religious crowd at that time. So here's what happened. Eventually, they sent Paul to Caesarea to stand trial as a Roman citizen. And he was held there for two years without bail. All because he brought a Gentile into the temple. And now he's in Caesarea. He's waiting, uh, he's waiting to stand trial. And he ends up sharing his... Uh, but Paul does not waste any opportunities to share the gospel. He ends up sharing his testimony with a man named Felix, who was actually the Roman governor. The Roman governor. And Felix actually listened to him. Because you want to know why Paul didn't keep his mouth shut. Because Paul was going to advance the kingdom. Paul was going to share Jesus with everybody that he comes in contact. So he doesn't waste any time. He shares with them. And then he ends up testifying also to King Agrippa. And, and these were both prominent leaders that he never ever would have got to share the gospel with had he not got arrested. Prominent leaders in that society that he never would have got to share with had he not got arrested. So you know what? I would say that that worked out good so he could end up sharing. However, they finally ended up putting Paul, after two years, they put him on a boat and they sent him as a prisoner to Rome. But guess what? It wasn't a luxurious cruise with smooth sailing. In the midst of sailing, this huge storm hits in the middle of the Mediterranean and they end up becoming shipwrecked. So he's been setting in, you know, jail for two years. He'd been beaten. All this had happened to him. They put him on this boat. They ship him off. This huge storm hits and ends up shipwrecking him on the island of Malta. And as they're sitting there on this island, they decide to build a fire so they can stay warm. So when Paul's building this fire, guess what jumps out of the wood? A snake. A poisonous snake. And it ends up latching on to Paul's hand. And Paul shakes it off and just keeps on going like it's no big deal. I don't know about you, I kind of flip out if uh, Judd was telling me some snake stories the other day, or earlier this morning, but I probably wouldn't handle it that well. Well, he shakes it off and going on, and then all the people thought uh, Paul was some kind of God. But finally, he ends up with chains, uh, brought in chains to Rome, and there in Rome, he ended up being kept on house arrest, and he was chained to a Roman soldier for another two years, waiting to see Caesar. Another two years, 
wow, that is amazing. And listen to this, guys. While he's waiting on house arrest for two more years, chained to a Roman soldier, uh, all these rumors start spreading around all over the place. And the rumors that start spreading around, his opponents were attempting to destroy his reputation and ruin his ministry. Now, that's a heck of a four years. Amen? How many of you want to switch places with Paul and have a four years like that? It just goes from one thing to the next, guys. I'm telling you what. Paul says, all of these things, all of these things, the false rumors, the riot, the beating, the arrest, the four years of confinement, the public misunderstanding, the slanders, the whispers, the accusations against me, the shipwreck, the bite, the house arrest in Rome. He says, all of these things were not just a bunch of lemons given to me to make me sad and to make me pucker and to make me be mad. Did he? He didn't say all these things were lemons. All these things were just, I got a, a raw deal handed to me. Listen, guys, never once in Scripture, never once will you see the Apostle Paul complaining about his circumstances. You just won't see it. He didn't complain. He didn't pass the buck. He didn't blame it on anybody else. He didn't go around. He didn't put it on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Google+, Plus, Pinterest, Twitter, or any other social media. He didn't go run it all down. He didn't share the world with his problems. Can I tell you that social media wasn't there at that time? But I promise you if social media was there, I believe that the Apostle Paul would have used it as a platform to praise God in the midst of his storms. Amen? Because that's what the Apostle Paul did. Because he had a walk with God. He had something. He understood something a little bit more than what was going on, guys. Listen to this. Paul had a great joy in the midst of his problems because he knew and he judged everything from kingdom priorities. He judged everything from kingdom priorities. He knew that God was in control of everything. He knew that God was in control of everything. And because of that fact, the Apostle Paul could rest. He could rest with the things that he'd been given in life. He could rest all that. And he could trust in God in the midst of it. Because you know what? Paul believed if he was going through it, there was a purpose. He believed if he was going through it, there was a purpose. Guys, I believe if I'm going through it, there's a purpose. And there's a reason for what I am that I'm going through it. And I believe if you're going through whatever it is that you're going through, there's a purpose. There's a reason much bigger than, than what you're seeing. And Paul believed that. And he believed that his purpose was to advance the gospel to Rome. See, Paul says even in other scriptures that he was going to go to Rome. But see, Paul thought he was going to go to Rome as a preacher, but instead he went as a prisoner. But he went as a prisoner that preached. Because the prisoner wasn't going to stop him. And he knew that his purpose was to advance that gospel to there. And because of that fact, Paul could rejoice. He could rejoice that he was going to share the gospel no matter what he went and no matter what. You see, Paul found his purpose at the other end of the chain. He found his purpose at the other end of the uh, chain. Paul was being guarded by a member of the elite Praetorian Guard. So what does that mean? Because we talk about it all the time, right? Paul was chained to a Roman soldier. He was chained to one of the elite Praetorian guards. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you a little bit about these guards. Who were these guys anyway? They were actually highly trained soldiers. They weren't just your typical run-of-the-mill soldiers. These guys were highly trained soldiers. They were a cross between secret service for the Caesars and the army special forces. These guys were tough. They had, they had it going on and they knew what was going on. And they were created by Caesar Augustus probably 70 years before Paul's time. And at Paul's days, they ended up numbering 9,000 to 12,000 people is how many was in the Praetorian Guards during that time. Nine to 12,000. These men were actually paid double the normal wage and they had served, they would serve for a 12-year sentence as being one of these guards. And after they retired, after they retired, uh, they ended up going into politics, most of them. When they retired, they were so high up that most of them retired and they became some of Rome's powerful political leaders of Rome. And in fact, some of them were even brought forth as nominees for the Roman Senate. So these weren't just like soldiers that didn't really know what they do. And they were really, really high up their people. And, uh, and, and they were uh, huge influences in, in, in the days of Rome. So what does all this mean? It means that the Praetorian Guards were the most important group in ancient Rome at that time. And God wanted to reach this group of believers and he wanted to influence Rome. He wanted to influence Rome with the gospel of Christ. And, and so you know what happened? You know what? If he sent Paul to Rome and he wanted to reach the political power, you know, uh, Paul would have probably had a really, really hard time renting some big Colosseum or renting some big place or some stadium and have a Rome for Christ crusade. Because I guarantee you, the Praetorian guards would not have came to it. 
They wouldn't have come to hear some man from Tarsus come and speak about some man named Jesus that they could care less or knew nothing about. So something had to happen so they could get on the inside. And um, and God sent his best man, which was Paul, God sent his best man, had him unjustly arrested, sent to Rome, where he was put in jail, chained to a member of the Praetorian Guard for 24 hours a day. Now listen to guys, this, listen to how this breaks down. 24 hours a day for two years. They were chained to a guard and they would rotate every six hours. That means that Paul had a new audience four times a day, 28 times a week, and over 2,900 times in two years. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of influence that Paul had, wouldn't you say? See, I would say before too long, Paul wasn't chained to them. They were chained to him. See, he didn't look at it as overwhelming circumstances. He looked at it as an opportunity to share Christ. Guys, listen, that was the beginning of an evangelism explosion in Rome. That was the beginning of uh, the news of Christ. That's why Paul could say in the scripture that we just read that the news about Christ had spread through the palace guards. Isn't that amazing? Guys, only God could do something like that. Only God could do something like that. Listen, guys, most of the time we don't know what we're going through. We do not know what God is doing in the midst of our troubles. And sometimes it's revealed much later. Sometimes we don't ever know. Sometimes we don't know the whole purpose. And I generally, honestly, I purpose or personally, I don't think that Paul had a clear understanding of what was going on. I don't think he had this big picture in mind. But you know what? I think he trusted God. I think he trusted God in the midst of his troubles. And I think that he knew somehow, some way, God was going to be glorified. And he was just going to keep being faithful. He was going to keep his attitude right. And Paul trusted that God had a bigger purpose. He had a bigger purpose. You know, I told you here a while back, um, several weeks ago, uh, that Rhonda and I would get up one Saturday morning and uh, we decide to take our kids to the MU uh, basketball game, to the girls' basketball game. And we get down there and we were on the wrong day. Well, can I tell you, that I did not even realize this till after the fact, but in the midst of our disappointment, in the midst of our heartache, the gospel was actually advanced to Haiti. Isn't that crazy? Because of our missed ball game, the gospel was advanced to Haiti. And I believe it was just God putting pieces together. What do you mean it was advanced to Haiti? Well, we went on the wrong day. We thought the MU girls basketball game was on Saturday. So we get there, my kids are pumped, they're excited about it. And then we find out it's the next day because we felt like Chevy Chase. We pull up in the parking lot and we're the only cars there. But I wasn't going to park in the back <laughs> to be the first one out. But we're sitting there and thinking, what's going on? How about that? Who puts these things here anyway? Need to move my pulpit up more. Or stand in place. Uh, but here, here we are. We miss it. We're in the midst of all this disappointment. And my kids' hearts are broke, but we end up having fun anyway. Well, here's the deal. I come to church, and I tell it in the sermon illustration one day. So we get home, and guess what? People feel sorry for me. So guess what we ended up receiving? We ended up receiving MU tickets to the Sprint Center to go see the girls' team. So you know what? We go to the Sprint Center, and that's where my buddy that's a pastor of evangelism or missions ends up telling me about the trip going to Haiti, and we end up passing that information on along. But had we not missed the MU game, we would have never went to the Sprint Center. That connection never would have ever been made. Guys, I'm telling you, we don't know what's going on in the midst of heartache. Now, you can sit here and say, well, that's not really very much trouble. I mean, that's not a, a what I would consider. And you're exactly right. I don't think that we had a poor us mentality and think that that was really much of a troubled time. But I'm just getting you to see the bigger picture that we don't know for sure how God's hands have worked. But I can tell you personally, personally, that I have seen the gospel advance through the death of children. I've seen the gospel advance through unexpected sickness. I've seen the gospel advance through the spouse walking away. I've seen the gospel advance through an unfortunate accident. I've seen the gospel advance through people losing their jobs. And I've seen the gospel advance through working with difficult people. You ever think instead of looking at that difficult person that gets on your nerves, maybe God's got you chained to them so you can share the gospel like the Apostle Paul did with the prison guard? You ever think about that? Instead of trying to find your way out, maybe God wants you to share while you're there. Wouldn't that be a different concept? Instead of hating my boss, maybe I want my boss to get saved. And God's got me there for a reason. 
Guys, listen, it's about being faithful where you're at. Listen, guys, I'm not saying it's going to be an easy process. I'm sure Paul didn't love the process. You know, even on the the night before Jesus' crucifixion, he's in the garden and he's praying. And we're going to talk about, you know, Easter and the resurrection and and Christ being crucified next week. and, And everything in our Christian walk all points to that. But even Jesus went to the garden and he prayed and sweat drops of blood because the anxiety level was so high on him. And he prayed, Lord, if there's any other way, remove this cup from me. But he said, nevertheless, your will be done. You know, the Apostle Paul, he trusted God to advance the gospel in this situation. And by sharing Jesus in tough times, and because of that, the Apostle Paul found joy in the tough times. And I believe that we can too. Amen. But I also want you to know that number two, tough times can also Tough times can also encourage others to witness as well. Listen, guys, the storms that we go through in life, they don't go unnoticed. They don't go unnoticed. People seize the difficult times. And and I tell you what, handled in the right way, your response can be a positive impact on others. If you handle the storms in your life, they can be a positive impact on others. This is what was going on here in verse 14 when Paul says, And because of my chains... Because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters became confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Guys, can I tell you that courage is contagious? Courage is contagious. Because of Paul's courage and his chains, it actually spread to other believers in Rome. These believers, they noticed Paul's joy in the midst of the trials. They understood his joy. They saw his joy in the midst of these. And they noticed that Paul was using every opportunity he could to share Christ with others. And they noticed his lack of fear. And they noticed that he refused to complain and blame others. And because of that, because of the way Paul handled his troubles, it became an encouragement to other believers to be bold. It became an encouragement to other believers to be bold. You know what happened? They looked at that and they had this fresh courage. They had this fresh courage well up inside of them. And they began to speak confidently about the Lord. All the fear was gone. They ended up sharing everyday conversations with their neighbors, with their co-workers, with people on the streets, with anyone and everyone. They had this newfound faith, this new freshness, this new boldness, this new confidence. And they dared to comp- or, uh, proclaim the gospel everywhere they went. Because of what was going on in Paul's life, they were thinking, you know what, if he can do it, I can do it. If he can do it, I can do it. And Paul's chains in the gospel spread throughout Rome, and everybody got excited. Listen, guys, tough times can be productive if they're handled right. Tough times can be productive if they're handled right. Because your tough times do not go unnoticed. They don't go unnoticed. People are paying attention, both non-believers and believers, and they're wondering how you're going to respond. They're wondering how you're going to respond, and they're sitting back and they're paying attention, guys. Listen, they are watching you and how you're going to respond. And can I tell you, honestly, most people are going to take their cue from you. They are. You're going to set the course. You're going to set the course. How you respond to things, people will jump in and they will join you. And uh, I tell you, if you jump on the negative bandwagon, guess what's going to happen? Everybody else is going to come right along with you, aren't they? You ever hear the phrase, misery loves company? Isn't that true? That's true. And I tell you what, if you start off negative, if you start off complaining and running everything down, then everybody's going to jump on the negative bandwagon right right along with you. Because there's always room for one more on the negative bandwagon. It's like an unlimited seating. And people will jump on that right along with you. However, guys, listen to this. However, if you praise the Lord in the midst of it, If you praise God in the midst of your storms, if you have this joy that's unspeakable, if you have this joy that people can't even understand, how are you going through what you're going through and have the peace and have the joy and keep proclaiming Jesus and keep doing that? You know what's going to end up happening? All of a sudden, people's going to start chattering. People that are going to, that don't even know the Lord, they're going to begin to begin to wonder, what the heck's going on with these people? People that don't know Jesus are going to think, how do you have that joy? How do you have that peace in the midst of this? Man, I want what you have because it seems like the the world and the waves are crashing all the way around you and you're sitting there smooth sailing through it all and you keep praising God. I want some of that. Where can I get me some of that? And then you know what else is going to happen? Because of your excitement and because of your encouragement in the Lord, then I tell you what's going to happen even in the Christian's life. Christians are going to be encouraged and they're going to begin to uh, praise God. And they're going to be able to start praising God in the midst with you. And it sparks a flame and an excitement and a boldness and a confidence in others to start sharing what God's doing in your life. Can I tell you one of the best examples that I've ever had the privilege of being a part of this? To see this truly, truly uh, displayed out 
happened close to May will be about five years ago. And it was with Jeremy and Tabby Searcy. Does anybody know them? About five years ago, coming up in May, and some of their families here. Some of their families here. Jeremy's mom's here and sister's here. And uh, they had a baby boy named Tristan. And Tristan only lived to be nine months old. And I tell you what, that Tristan, at nine months old, touched more people's life than most of you guys have your whole adult life. Because he touched so many lives, guys. I'm telling you what, I seen Jeremy and Tabby walked with them behind the scenes, preached at the funeral, was there at their bedside when, when Tristan had passed away or just a few minutes after in St. Louis or uh, Kansas City. And, and I tell you what, these guys walked through with a joy that was unspeakable. And I'm not talking about being happy about the circumstances. I'm not talking about that because they stunk. They stunk. But you know what Jeremy and Tabby did? They trusted God in the process. And they kept praising God. And they kept giving it all to Him. And they kept walking it out. And they kept walking it out in their faith. And you know what ended up happening? Because of the joy that they had in their heart. Because they kept proclaiming God. They didn't curse Him. They didn't swear Him. They didn't shake their fists in His face. You know what ended up happening? Family members got excited. Family got excited. Community got excited. Everybody started preaching Jesus. Everybody started talking more about God. And I tell you what, family members got saved. Friends got saved. People in the community got saved. All because they were talking about the joy of the Lord that God had in their life. And they trusted Him. They trusted Him in the midst of one of the darkest times in a person's life. Guys, can I tell you, I have no idea how I would handle a situation like that if my nun, my full baby. But you know what? That time in my life, that time in my life, Jeremy and Tabby became some of my heroes in the faith. Because of one of the saddest times, one of the saddest times in their life, they ended up becoming one of the most amazing times to be a part of. That funeral was literally a celebration of life service. Man, I'm telling you, I've seen 9,500 year old people that pass away and those walked it out in the Lord and it's truly a celebration for life. But I've never seen a baby pass away and become a celebration for life. And God moved in a great way in that day and in that time in people's life. Because you know why? They handled it the right way. Listen, guys, oftentimes we say, you know, the circumstances in life are too tough. And you know what? When circumstances get better, then I'll share however I say. And God says, you need to speak up now. You need to speak up now, even in the tough times. Let others see the joy that you have in the midst of a world falling apart because others will catch it and the fire is easier caught than taught, guys. When people see you walking it out in victory, they see you what God's doing in your life, then I'm telling you what, people will get excited about the Lord. So are you complaining and grumbling, or are you giving God praise and joy in the midst of it? Giving praise and joy. Now, however, I do want, with that being said, brings us to the third point. Don't get down and discouraged when other people don't respond in the way that you think they should. Because not everybody's going to be on your side. Not everybody's going to rejoice with you. And you know what? That's okay. Number three is tough times can also reveal the heart of others. Amen? You ever went through a tough time before and figured out who your friends are? You know, you find out that you have some faithful friends and you find out that some not so much. And this is what was going on in verses 15 through 17. It says this. It says that there was two groups of believers that got stirred up. And because of Paul's chains, they both began to preach Jesus both had the same message, but they couldn't be more opposite. They couldn't be more opposite. Listen to what the scripture says here. It says that it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill, and the later do out of love, knowing that I am put here in the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. So listen, guys, we see that one group, they loved Paul, and they preached with good motives, and the other group, guess what? Well, they were jealous of Paul's leadership, and they took advantage of his imprisonment to divide the body of Christ. They were doing it with completely the wrong motives. Now, the Bible doesn't exactly say exactly what was going on with these selfish preachers, but I do believe that they were not false prophets. I do not believe that they were false prophets. I don't believe that they were preaching the wrong thing. Because if they were, I believe Paul would have spoken against them. Because Paul didn't hold back. He didn't say, hey, go, go preach you know, the wrong gospel. Go do this. I mean, he got people right where they were at. That's why I don't believe that they were false prophets. I believe that these men were true believers. However, they were using Paul's situation to open the door to advance their own cause. They were using his situation to advance their own cause. They had the right message, the gospel, but they preached it with the wrong motives. The message was good, the motives were bad. 
See, Paul didn't get excited because you know what? They still were preaching Jesus and he figured, you know what? God's going to deal with their heart. God's going to deal with their motives. He's going to deal with what's going on on the inside, guys. And because of the motives were bad, they were stirring up all this envy and strife. They were stirring up all this stuff on the inside. Listen, guys, Paul's aim was to glorify Christ and get people to follow him. But unfortunately, these selfish people, they were in it for themselves. Instead of asking people if they trusted Christ, you know what they were doing? They were like saying stuff like, whose side are you on? Ours or Paul's? Who cares? What church you go to? Who cares? That's what Paul's saying. Who cares? Their motives were wrong. They were trying to bend people on their side, guys. They were trying to capitalize Paul being in prison and they were trying to run him down to build up their own following. Guys, listen, they wanted the gospel to build their kingdom and not God's. They wanted to build their own kingdom and not God's. And they saw the service to Christ as some sort of competition. As some sort of competition. Guys, can I tell you the sad fact is, is this attitude still goes on today. People are all the time trying to push their own agenda, trying to build their own cause, trying to do their own thing out of selfish ambition. And you know what it does? It causes strife. It causes dissension. It causes things to slowly start going out of control, guys. Now listen, I want us to be aware of a few things because I want us to make sure that we keep our guard up. Because I want to protect what we have here. I want to protect what we have at life point, And I want to make sure that we continue to advance God's kingdom. Not mine, not yours, not anybody else's. I want to advance God's kingdom. So, you know, here's some things that I just want us to be aware of in this church that we need to make sure. You know, one of the best things when it comes to this church is with a brand new church start is there's no tradition. Isn't that great? I mean, you're not tied to anything. You can do whatever you want. There's no tradition. There's nothing to look back on and say this or that. However, guys, we've already went through two Christmases now, and this will be our second Easter. And coming up in September, we'll actually mark our two years of being open. You know, that's amazing how time flies. Amen? It is. It's amazing. Now, I believe one of the reasons that LifePoint has grown so much in this short time is because of its innocence. It's because of its innocence. It's because we've tried to keep things pure, real, and simple. We haven't tried to get bogged down in a bunch of junk. We've tried to keep the main thing, the main thing, and stay focused. However, as we grow, guess what? Things change. You know, we've tried to keep things humble in our approach to ministry. We've tried to be selfless in our approach to ministry. We've tried to not push agendas. We've tried to not be demanding. Uh, you know, even within the midst of us, nobody here has been demanding. Nobody here has been trying to push agendas and keep things, uh, that strife and bitterness. However... However, guys, listen, what we have will go away if we do not protect it. What we have will go away if we don't protect it. I don't want it to go away, guys. Listen, the very thing that we celebrate, not being tied to tradition, pride, selfishness, uh, the very thing that we, we, uh, we celebrate in will actually be the very thing that brings us down if we are not careful. Because pride goes before the fall. We need to keep stay humble. We need to stay on our face. Because here's the deal, guys. We're gonna as we grow, change is unavoidable. How many things have we changed already just in the in the year and a half that we've been? Because we've had to change things. We've had to do things. Every time you come in, we even have the seats in a little different angle, a different way. Who cares? Well, I can't find my seat. That's on purpose. Go find another one. Don't get so bogged down with all that stuff. You know what? As we grow, uh, you know, I don't like going to two services. I don't know who's at first. Okay, so who do you want us to tell not to come to Christ then? You know, we got to make room. Or when we get a bigger building. Well, I don't like the building. You know, it's not like home. Well, let's make it like home. We get a bigger building, we go to one service. Well, I don't want to go to one service, you know. I like the two options. I don't want to go to three services. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I don't like the music. I don't like this. I don't like that. Guys, instead of looking at everything in a positive way like we do right now, we start looking at stuff in the negative way, and then all of a sudden we come to mean, ugly, bitter church people that I swore we never going to do. So you know what's going to happen? If you guys become mean, ugly, bitter church people, you're going to find another pastor, and I'm going to open another one down the road. <laughs> and you're not invited. <laughs> See, that was a bonus. I didn't have that in my notes. That must have been a God thing, right? But listen, guys, we become a bunch of disgruntled people with our own selfish agenda trying to advance the kingdom the way that we want to and not the way that God wants to. What do you say we just stay humble? 
What do you say we just keep trusting God? And, and you know what? If we mess up, if we make some mistakes, you know what? God will fix them and we'll keep going forward because we're going to do them with the right heart, not the wrong motives. We're going to try to build God's kingdom and not ours. So let's protect that. But I also see selfish attitudes sometimes in our communities. You know what? Not necessarily this one, but you see churches, they work against each other and they compete instead of cooperate. We want to be the best and we somehow, some way, we broadcast and celebrate in other churches' weaknesses to build our own. Guys, can I tell you, this should not be. This should not be. You know, if they're preaching Christ, I don't care where you go. You don't have to go here. We're on the same team. We need to be unity. We need to come together with the gospel of Christ. You know, we've been given an assignment to reach the 12,000 in Chillicothe that's not going to church. You know, that 12,000 is not necessarily Life Point Church reaching those 12,000. God has given us as Christians together to go reach the 12,000. You know, there's enough people in Chillicothe to overflow every single church. Let's go get them. If Life Point's not it, you know, there's plenty other to pick from. Let's invite them to church. Let's invite them to the Lord. Jesus, let's make sure we're watching out and making sure that we are not into this selfish ambition uh, just to for, build our own congregations and not God's kingdom. And then the last thing I see on this when it comes to selfish attitude is sometimes we have that in our relationships. You know, we... Um, People go through tough times, and instead of us praying for them and reaching out to them, we find ourselves talking about them. Why don't we go love on them? Why don't we go reach people? Why don't we go love on them and pray for them and encourage people? Listen, guys, this is a kind of attitude that's completely contrary to what a Christian says we should go do. You know, going through tough times will reveal the heart of others. And then number four, tough times can also reveal your own heart. can also reveal your own heart. Listen, guys, the Apostle Paul could not get mad at those guys that came against him, did he? He didn't get mad. He didn't say, you guys are a bunch of jerks. You know, you're trying to capitalize on my tough times. You're doing everything wrong. I don't agree with you. You're unbiblical. I hope you fall flat on your face. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say that at all. You know, because he knew that God would deal with their motives, but they were still preaching Jesus. In verse 18, verse 18, Paul reveals his heart. And he says this, he says, but what does it matter? The important thing that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Amen. So here's the conclusion that Paul came to. He said he chose to rejoice in spite of his critics. He chose to rejoice in spite of his critics. Paul's only concern was the gospel being advanced. He didn't care whether people liked him or not. Now, obviously, he was a good guy because he even says in scriptures, as much as it depends upon him to be at peace with all men. But just because I try to be at peace with you doesn't mean that you still like me. And Paul wasn't going to get swayed. He wasn't going to get off track with people that, that thought that they were better than him or, or people that was trying to uh, run down him being in jail or how they felt about him being in jail. You know, he's seen the gospel being advanced through Rome. He could see the gospel being advanced, and he said that that is the right thing, and that's what it's all about. Listen, friend, how's your heart when it comes to others? When you're going through tough times, do you find yourself getting bitter towards other people, especially people that aren't very nice to you? Because sometimes that can happen. It's hard to keep that joy in the midst of tough times. But I tell you, if somebody is doing something wrong to me and I'm in the midst of tough times, how do you respond to them? How do you respond to them? How do you respond when people say hurtful things towards you? You know, maybe find yourself getting a little envious and jealous even towards other people. Guys, can I tell you, don't let your heart get calloused. Keep the main thing the main thing. You ever heard that before? That's what Paul did. Paul kept the main thing the main thing. You know, through the tough times, through the troubles, through the good times, through everything, he had joy because the gospel was being advanced. That's the main thing. I don't know why we go through what we go through. I don't know the troubles that we have. And sometimes, you know, some are worse than others. Sometimes things are very devastating. But I know if we trust God that we can have a joy. That's what Paul did. Don't let your heart get calloused. Be careful in the tough times. Keep your guard up. Keep going Whatever you're going through, keep giving it to God and know that there's a greater purpose and maybe you're just not seeing it right now. Maybe you're not seeing the greater purpose. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up. I read about this story and uh, this guy, uh, he shared his experience back when he was in college. He was working in a carpet mill. And I, I, I read this story and I thought, man, that is so that is so true in life. But he explained the carpet mill that he worked at as even related it to the tough times and the troubles that we go through. But he said when he was working at this carpet mill, he said you could come in, and he said on the back side of the machine was a whole bunch of huge spools of yarn. 
And all this yarn was all different colors. And they were spinning and the th- yarn was all going into the machine. And all you could see was chaos. I mean, from the backside, all this yarn just spinning into that. And it was loud and it was real noisy and you couldn't see anything. And all you could see was going in there. And it seemed like a lot of chaos when you get in there. However, when you walked around to the other side of the yarn machine or the carpet machine, when you walked around to the other side, all of a sudden, row by row, this carpet was coming out with all these different colors, making this beautiful pattern, making this wonderful thing that this carpet was coming out. Now, guys, can I tell you that that carpet didn't just come out by random chance looking good. There was a there was a master designer. There was somebody behind it that typed it all in, that put all in what this carpet needed to look like and what it needed to look like. Guys, can I tell you, here's the deal. Here's the deal with our life. So much like the carpet mill, we stand on the backside. We see all this different colors of yarn. We see this. Uh, we see the, the dark colors of sad and confusion and all the tough times. We see the multicolors of thread and all the bright colors of happiness and success. And on this side, it looks like pretty much chaos when we're going through it. We don't have a clue what it is that we're doing. And sometimes God gives us a little glimpse. He gives us a little glimpse of His work and His handiwork. But however, on this side of eternity... Sometimes we don't have the whole big picture. We don't have the whole big picture of what exactly everything's going to end up looking like. But I can tell you, when you trust God with your life, it's going to make sense on the other side of eternity. And you're going to see this beautiful picture of what your life ended up being and representing. All the dark colors, all the bright colors, all mixed together. It's going to seem one perfect, wonderful blend. And that's the big picture of what heaven's going to look like when we get to that side. And we're going to understand the purpose. Even the pain, and the heartache that we go through. Listen, church. None of us are exempt from going through tough times. We're all going to go through times when we feel like life has just given us some limits. However, when you get your limits, you know what you're going to do? You need to give them back to God. And you need to trust God with the limits. You need to trust God with the good times. And you need to understand that there is a purpose with this. There is a purpose with this. And know that in those times, you can find joy in the gospel being advanced through you and through others if you handle them right. And not everyone's going to be on your side. But you know what? As long as your heart's right, that's okay. Because we have an audience of one. And that's the Lord Jesus Himself. So trust Him with your life. And Paul found joy in this way. And so can we in the midst of when life gives us limits. Amen? I want us to rise to our feet. And I want us to bow our heads for just a second. Because I want to ask you today, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because I tell you what, you can't have any of it without Jesus. Well, I'm going through a really bad time right now, and I can't even see God in this. But you got, you know what? Through that bad times, through the hard times, just like in the message. Maybe today's the day of salvation. Maybe today's the day that you give your heart to Christ. Maybe it's in the tough times that they become your best times because your eternity becomes secure. So with everybody's head bowed and everybody's eyes closed, I just want to ask right now, if you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 